So this is uh, Thomas with LibertarianProgressive.com, also blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. Uh, we're the real election channel because we cover everyone on the ballot. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent and third-party candidates who are on the ballot. Green Party, independents, libertarians, no party affiliation, and other parties. And uh, we believe if a candidate is on the ballot and, um, and they have a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in all the debates and interview them. And we're specifically looking for candidates who are the only alternate choice, like our guest today, Paula Overby, who is running with the Independence Party for the U.S. House of Representatives in Minnesota, District Number 2 uh, for the election year 2016. So people always say, you know, I only have two choices, the lesser of two evils. Well, we're going to have at least 50 candidates um, at LibertarianProgressive.com. You can see the full interviews. Um, of alternate choices. So you do have a choice. I'm going to conduct these interviews, and I hope many other people conduct these interviews with these candidates, give them exposure. It's up to you to share them and uh, and, and give light to the uh, American populace uh, of our choices. So, Paula, good to talk to you today. Thank you for taking the time, um, you know, to to get the word out here. And uh, so... Um, I, you know, we have some questions to ask you, and um, but the first thing um, I always ask is, uh, looking at your website, you have a platform, you have an issues list, and it's a healthy list here of at least 10 <laughs> issues, and, uh, and that's you... good because, I'm sorry to interrupt, but whenever I go to a website and someone doesn't have an issue list, that always kind of concerns me. I mean, what are they running on? Just, you know something superficial so i'm glad you have an issues list on your website could you go through that issues list i know it's you know um kind of like 12 or so issues but i think that's the most substance thing substantive thing to talk about so if you don't mind if you could just kind of give a brief on each of your platform issues what you're running on why you're better than the other candidates well uh first of all i i really appreciate your introduction uh that's a, a major part of our initiative, is really uh, try and reform our political process uh, to address the extreme polarization that's happening in our, uh, in our Congress today, the frustration that people have with the choices or lack of choices. Um, I, you know, I, the issues uh, I present, I think it's fair and reasonable as a candidate to present, a, you know, a broad perspective of what my opinions and perceptions are on the various issues of importance to people. Um, we can go down the list here if you'd like, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see it at PaulaOverby.com. Um, it's P-A-U-L-A-O-V-E-R-B-Y.com. And then you'll see the menu at the top about donate, contact us, events, and there's the issues list, everything from government of the people, by the people, and for the people, health care, education, jobs, energy, conservation, money management, social justice, war on drugs, privacy, immigration, families, violence, separation of church and state, defense, and gun control. Um, let's start with government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The, and, and again, and that's our primary initiative. Uh, we started, we ran first in 2014. This is our second campaign. Um, our focus has never been for the sole purpose of winning. Our sole, our purpose is to reform our political process, to make politics more engaging and more meaningful to people, and to give people meaningful choices. Uh, I think when we've accomplished that goal, we will have won. Uh, we see it, you know, uh, definitely in the presidential election uh, Millions of voters being excluded from the selection process. Uh, a lot of anxiety about fraud and collusion and manipulation of the process. Uh, people are frustrated. So, so um, yeah, a big no, part of our focus continue. has really been on establishing candidate forums. Uh, our two-party system works very hard to try and exclude uh, third-party candidates from the from the media, from forums, from debates. Yeah, so, what, so if we're going to have government of the people, you, we have to have, what's that? What reforms would you um, 
present for election reform? Uh, well, one of the big initiatives here in Minnesota that I, I support wholeheartedly would be uh, ranked choice voting or uh, instant runoff voting, uh, like variations in those systems. But it allows people to, to, to pick their first choice, you know, and then if their first choice doesn't get a sufficient number of votes, then their second choice will count. Uh, so it, it eliminates that fear factor voting. It allows people to vote for the issues, the candidates that they want to vote for, that they support, and still have a meaningful you know, vote in the election and the, and the final vote. Well, that sounds uh, awesome. I and I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think there's just a few second delay here. Um, no, that's an excellent reform. And uh, go ahead. You're about to say something else. Uh, I'm a, certainly a major advocate of uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, we emphasize, uh, you know, equal voice for small dollar donors. Uh, we support the uh, May Day initiative, the $200 tax credit, uh, eliminating super PACs. Uh, it totally skews our uh, entire political process. People have virtually no voice in our public policy. Yeah, and I think the score voting or rank voting would be a good place to start at, you know, and um, and so a lot of people don't know about that, but that's a very, very interesting idea. Uh, well, let's go through the issues real quick, and then we can come back to some of the ones that, you, you know, um, uh, what about health care? Health care. <laughs> uh, well, I'm I mean, a bit of a kind of a, I mean, my overall platform, where you can look at any of my issues is, is a focus on community development, um, worker-owned business uh, and farms, small business development. Uh, and so with, with regards to health care, in my district in Minnesota, uh, we have a, a kind of a unique health care, localized health care system called uh, county-based purchasing. And I definitely support support that model of health care delivery uh, it's being you know it's being phased out by pressures from the Affordable Care Act and the pressure to for citizens to use uh, large insurance companies and HMOs and you know it's at, at a very at an excessive cost yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, it's um, so. I mean, healthcare used to be about taking purchase. care of people. Um, now it's it's really an industry that's driven by profits, and an industry that's driven by profits is not customer focused. Um, I mean, you look at the drug industry; it's uh, absolutely obscene what's going on with the cost of drugs today. Uh, someone that people are probably most familiar is the EpiPen. Uh, just broke the news. But there's dozens of examples of, you know, a predatory drug pricing. Um, well, we pay, we can, what, like twice as much as most any other country, I think, in prescription well, drugs. Highest drug prices in the world by far, yeah. You take a drug like uh, Harvani, uh, a new drug for hepatitis C. Uh, that goes for $1,000 a pill, and it's a 28-week treatment. So it's like a $95,000 treatment program. Same drug as it's in India for about $900. So you know what their manufacturing costs are. Why don't you tell us? Uh, You know, so, I mean, if if government can force us to buy insurance, they can certainly regulate the cost of uh, the other side of the coin and regulate the cost of uh, prescription drugs and manage the cost of health care delivery. Now that also but more importantly, segue into, um, oh, but continue with your last point there, and I'm sorry, there's just a little bit of a delay, but also continue into the war on drugs since we're talking about drugs. Uh, yeah, well, that, I mean that's the other side of of the uh, the drug issue. Uh, taxpayers are spending you know, an outrageous amount of money to fight that war. We're certainly not winning. Um, more people die from prescription drug overdoses than they do from illicit drugs. Um, 
medical marijuana is becoming a significant issue. We've got, what, five states now that have passed marijuana reform. Uh, our federal government is about 30 years behind on that issue. <clears throat> they refuse to fund. I mean, it's an herbal medicine, right? <laughs> so we're, we're not going to allow the public to have herbal medicines and, and do self-care. We're going to force them to buy prescription drugs. Uh, yeah, that's right. We have actually refugees going from one state to some of those five states that you just mentioned about. I, I call them refugees almost, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, it's uh, it, it's out of control. And it, we have a government in Washington that's basically dysfunctional. Uh, I do believe that they're, they're trying to work out a deal to prevent another co- government shutdown as we speak. Um, they're trying to keep that quiet, I guess. <laughs> now, um, let's segue into, and we'll definitely come back on any of these topics, but you have such a wide range of issues. I'd like to hear something about all of them, and it's something that is unique to your campaign because a lot of you know, the mainstream uh, don't really touch on a lot of these issues. Uh, could, could you um, talk a little to us uh, and our audience about um, education and jobs? Well, I mean, jobs goes into goes along with my models for community development. Uh, a lot of the metrics that we have, I mean, jobs is always the issue, right? Economy is always the issue. It's the number one issue on people's minds, uh, and rightfully so. It's about our our well-being, our survival, even. But jobs, uh, the, the issue is livable wages. Okay, some of the metrics we're using just don't make sense anymore. Gross domestic product, uh, jobless rate. The the real issue is what's the cost of living? Okay, if I own a home and I make $40,000 a year, I'm better off than somebody that's paying a $2,000 mortgage making 75000 a year, right? Yeah. So, you know, median income keeps going up, but the cost of living isn't keeping, is, is going ahead of it. So for the creation of, again, it's about restoring economic development to our local communities, to putting control, investment, uh, where it can be managed by the people. So energy is a, is a great example. I think, you know, we need a federal, we definitely need a federal energy policy. Fossil fuels are on their way out, all right? And, and taxpayers are subsidizing fossil fuels to try and keep that industry alive. Uh, government ought to be helping to transition that us to uh, solar energy or renewable, not solar perhaps, but renewable energies. Uh, that has a great market potential for localized community development, for uh, worker-owned businesses or, you know, investor-owned, locally investor-owned businesses. That creates quality jobs and it protects our environment. Um, and yeah, that on the sounds other end, good. I think there's. I'm sorry, Paula. There's a lot of probably consensus with that. Um, you know, Germany has most of their energy from solar, and I think France has most of it from nuclear. And, and there's Costa Rica actually um, has a good track record with that as well. And so now all this is going to cost some money, I suppose, to invest. So how about um, you had an issue called money management as well? Well, yeah, and that's where government really needs to take a front row seat. Uh, government has put, been pushing off its responsibilities to the private sector for several decades now, and the private sector is not managing our financial markets. Okay, they have this Wall Street investment strategy Seven percent of our gross domestic product is financial instruments. It's paper money. That's where the growth in our economy exists. There is no growth. We have corporations that are making more money off of their financial instruments than they're making off of their products. Do you have a GM credit card? I don't have a GM credit card, but I have a credit card. (laughs) Well, we all have credit cards. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) And, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, I have positions on, you know, bank. And so government needs to take, get, you know, take the reins on that again. We need to restore some of those banking regulations that came after the Great Depression. Uh, 
regulations that held financial markets for several decades, um, many like decades. Google. Like, yeah, until, you know, and a lot of that was repealed during the Clinton administration. And right. now, let's, we look at the uh, subprime mortgage sure. crisis of 2008, that's the result. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and there's you know this we're in the so-called recovery right now. Um, well, let's go into some um, social issues because you put on here social justice, privacy, um, immigration, families, violence. You know. Yeah, uh, social justice. <laughs> that's a broad term. Uh, it, it's an uh, ambiguous term, perhaps, but uh, I'll just use the best example. The, the the most obvious example, the United States has one of the largest slave populations in the world. We call them prisoners. And it goes back to the war on drugs again, too. A lot of those people are, are drug offenders, a lot of them minor drug offenders. But they provide uh, billions of dollars worth of free labor to corporate interests and, you know, state and government interests as well. That's yeah, not social that's justice. Uh, you know, marginalized communities are definitely uh, oftentimes afraid of the police. You know, they're not, they don't feel like the police are, uh, you know, protecting their communities or protecting them. They feel threatened. And the top end of that scale would be the 1033 program where the Department of Defense is giving away military hardware to police departments. And what are the what are yeah. police departments? What's that? I just can't say it's like we're in occupied territory almost, you know, if they give any more militarized, you know, equipment. Yep. The National Defense Act authorized the use of military force against American citizens. It's a dangerous precedent. And we're moving in a very dangerous direction. It's the other side of the whole gun control issue. Yeah, which you did mention gun gun control um, as well. Yes, absolutely. And you so, want to say, um, yeah, explain your issue on um, uh, your stance, your present stance on gun control. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a po- another polarizing issue. That's uh, that's how our two party politics works. We just polarize the public, keep them divided, don't give them any real choices. Uh, most people. Uh, favor reasonable uh, checks on gun gun usage, gun purchase, gun control, uh, things like background checks. Um, and as do I. You know, I, I think it, it, it's a very a, a dangerous tool, and society has a right to, to provide some regulation of that and assure accountability and responsibility for that. The problem is, I mean, you can't threaten to take away everybody's guns while your military is in your police departments. <clears throat> it's kind of alien to uh, America's sense of freedom. But the, the problem that, that happens and the things that people worry about that, that, you know, oppose gun control is that once you give, you know, again, you're empowering police and prosecutors. And once you give them that tool, then they start to expand on the use of that tool, and you start to get into issues of uh, profiling and uh, exclusion and even harassment. Yeah, there's some states where people who, um, you know, were charged with marijuana are not allowed to get a gun. Some people have been put on the no-fly list that, uh, you, you know, um, have no idea how they got on it and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the Patriot Act. <laughs> Don't ask me about the Patriot Act. Um, yeah, that's you know, true. a lot of my. I mean, that's a, vote a lot of my principles and values. I mean, social justice. A lot of those are libertarian values. Or do yeah, Paul, I, I agree. I think anyone who voted for the Patriot Act is basically voting against the Fourth Amendment. Uh, quite honestly, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's expanding the power and control of a of a ruling elite, which can't even identify. Uh, it's a globalization of American politics, American economy, um, the TPP, 
uh, is another example of that expansion of power, global power. Uh, and all of that uh, infringes on the rights of citizens. All right, um, now let's hear regulate and some, small business, okay. you know. <laughs> now, what uh, about small um, business creates you, economic growth? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So tell us about tell us a little bit about small and mid-sized businesses because um, you know there's a track record over the last ten years that the amount of small and mid-sized businesses has been declining in new startups. It is, and. Part of the reason, of course, is the chaos in our financial markets. Small business can't get capital. And one reason, our, and, that's probab- and that is the main reason that our economy has been so stagnant. Uh, you know, we're getting meaningless job, jobless figures uh, that supposedly tell us our economy is, is in great shape. But again, you know, we lost, what, 7, 8 million jobs in the subprime mortgage crisis, a third of those were high-paying jobs that have been replaced with service-level jobs. That's not a net gain. That's not progress. So uh, what can we do to business. help small and mid-sized businesses? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, please. It's small business, mid-sized businesses, uh, growth businesses that create economic opportunity and jobs with livable wages. And those business are, businesses are struggling to get capital. They can't get capital for, for expansion and growth. Um, the, the big corporations aren't, again, going back to the financial markets, a lot of big corporations aren't investing in product development either. You know, in fact, some of them are they're borrowing money because we have such a ridiculously low interest rate to sustain this hobbled economy. They're borrowing money to invest in stock, <laughs> to, to invest in the market and financial instruments. Yeah, unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Um, so and you, and that's the responsibility of our support. Congress. Go and ahead. How can we get more? Ca- how can we get more capital to small and mid-sized businesses? Well, by creating um, tax structures, by creating uh, generally taxing is, is the way those financial markets are manipulated. Uh, some of it would definitely be one of the first steps in the, in, that I would recommend would be some regulation on, on the markets, definitely regulation of Wall Street and particularly short-term investments. Uh, there should be outrageous capital gains taxes on short-term investments. Because short-term investment is not a, a growth strategy. It's not a long-term strategy. It's not a sustainable strategy. We've seen American bailing out those failed strategies more than once. How many times have we bailed out the auto industry? Yeah, the that's a very, industry. very good point, actually. We're rewarding the people who fail at the expense of the people who should be up and coming and buying out those ba- failed businesses. Instead, we keep propping up the failed ones and not giving way to the newcomers that should be coming in and, you know, through competition and, uh, and, and flourishing, you know? Yep. And that's why our economy is so stagnant. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now let's go real quick into um, immigration, families, immigration and families. Well, I feel bad for families these days. That's for sure. Uh, There's virtually no support for families anymore. Um, and a lot of it has to do with just the social uh, labor and labor environment that we're creating in this country. I guess it relates to immigration. Um, you know, immigration is is unavoidable in a you know in a capitalist society. Uh, we've had a major decline in in the birth rate in the middle class which is, you know, primarily white society in America. And ideally, you know, that would reach a, a zero growth point and you'd have a sustainable ongoing society, economy. Uh, capitalism doesn't work that way. Capitalism depends on growth. Okay, it depends on consumption. 
uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a cancer. It just keeps growing uncontrollably until it consumes the whole body. And so, and so because the birth rate is so low, we, and to sustain that growth, uh, we have to have immigration. The problem with immigration is that conglomerates, the wealthy conglomerates, Again, nobody can really put a meaningful title on on what that is. Um, they exploit that immigrant workforce for low wage uh, labor, and the middle class, the taxpayers, end up paying the social costs for that immigration population. That's really unbalanced, and it makes people angry. And that's the real issue around immigration. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. You're not, I mean, point. Trump's idea of sending the immigrants all back home is ridiculous. It would destroy this economy. It's impossibly need immigration reform. Well, okay, so now you had an issue here um, you titled violence. Can you expand on that, please? Um, well, I think, you know, I've pretty much covered that in terms of the issues of gun control and Okay. and the militarization of our police, uh, you know, we need to stop stop the war against our own citizens, which is essentially what the war on drugs is. Um, the Patriot Act is really uh, an extension of that. Do, does any of us feel safer because we take our shoes off at the airport? When women are getting frisked at the airport. Um, it's outrageous. And it, it, it just it creates the illusion that they're doing something to protect us from terrorism. But terrorism is not the problem. We have a mass killing uh, every week in this country. Hey, it's getting so common that you don't even see it in the news anymore. You know, yeah. if it's not more than 50 people like we had in Orlando. Right. right. Uh, that's uh, violence in America. And that's, you know, that's the social polar That's the polarization of America. That's the militarization of our police. That's the war against our own society. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of Black Lives Matter. Um, yeah. They have a legitimate complaint. Uh, black men are getting shot in the back, gunned down in the streets, uh, and there's absolutely no consequence. And, That's and a, the reason why is we, we, you know, because we're living in the status quo, and, and maybe you know we might need to think outside the box a little bit. And that's why we're interviewing you. And, and thankfully you're someone who was able to get on the ballots. And um, so you did mention here separation of church and state and um, as well as defense. And so, yeah, what is your stance on the separation of church and states? Well, I, I, to me, the original idea behind separation of church and state was to prevent the corrupting power of, uh, or the cor- corrupting influence of wealth and power from assuming the power of God, right? The I mean, it, it kind of descends from our British heritage and the angelic and uh, angelic. I'm sorry, I'm having a mental block. Anyway, the Church of England. Uh, farther back, I guess it goes towards uh, the Vatican and Rome and the power of uh, and their influence in the Middle Ages and beyond, and even today. <clears throat> but you know, church has always been uh, active in you know political ch- or social change um, long before Martin Luther King. Uh, it's still a major political hot button today. You got the the Democrats uh, or the moral majority uh, attacking the Democrats for their weak moral values, and you got the Democrats uh, attacking the um, religious groups for their bigotry. It's just, it's become just another polarizing issue. And now we've got the Muslims and Sharia law to worry about, right? But Yeah. Yeah, no, I, but, I, I hear you on that. And uh, so... But the, um, but the broader issue is, 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 again, public engagement in politics. Uh, one of the initiatives that we're working on, actually, this campaign is is with faith communities to establish candidate forums and make our candidates more accountable to people. And and churches, faith groups represent community organizations. Uh, and God and religion besides, 
community organizations are being systematically uh, shut out of our political process. And a lot of it has to do with uh, 501c status and the IRS rules. So, um, and, and it looks like we probably need a lot of separation between a lot of things and, and state, like corporation and states and just any kind of special interest group, you, you, you know. Um, not to say that they don't have legitimate interests, but um, sometimes they use the government to, uh, you know, have undue influence. And, um, well, now you did mention defense on here. Um, and so if you could tell us your stance on defense. Defense, uh, I, well, I certainly believe in a strong defense. Uh, you know, the best offense is a strong defense. But I don't see our current political agenda uh, use, using our military for defense. Uh, it's become a very offensive weapon uh, uh, used very much for economic purposes. Uh, benefit, benefiting again, in this case, not the healthcare industry, but the uh, weapons industry. We have, you know, our engagement in the Middle East goes back, oh gosh, before my time even. I think as far back as Kennedy even. Uh, 20 years ago, we were arming the Taliban against the Russians. Uh, 20 years later, we're fighting the Taliban. Uh, we pour massive amounts of weapons into that region. And even after the Cold War, you know, all of those weapons that were disseminating around the world went into South Africa, right? Remember the Blood Diamond uh, era? Yeah. Yeah, and Not also, Africa, I mean, I think... South or Africa, excuse me. It goes as far back as World War II when we started, you know, wanting more oil, and, and we... Um, you know, used the CIA to take out the, uh, you know, the president of Iran. And, you know, there was a coup that happened there. I think that was during the Eisenhower administration. So, yeah, we've been uh, in the Middle East for a long time. So we're, I mean, we're, we've definitely been a major factor in destabilizing that region. And uh, anyone who doesn't believe it's about the oil and economics uh, just isn't paying attention. Uh, I mean, if you, if, oh, you know, they tell us it's about terrorism, they tell us it's about uh, genocide, whatever. I mean, there have been some enormous atrocities over there. There's no doubt about that. The uh, sarin gas, the uh, chlorine gas recently, um, those atrocities are going on all over the world. Uh, some horrible genocide going on in countries in Africa. And nobody's paying attention to that. Yeah, that's a really good point you got there. I mean, we have to be consistent, you know, just like we should be consistent, you know, if we're going to lock someone up for doing marijuana, then how come we're not locking up the last three presidents, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I tried pot once, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> now, let me ask you this question, because this is something I ask of everyone, um, and I always uh, fi find it somewhat interesting here. Um, you know, tell us some of your favorite uh, past or present people, whether they've been elected to office or, or not, if you don't mind. Oh, dear. Uh, I guess I'm still kind of a Wellstone fan. Uh, he was definitely outside the box, um, definitely not within the – uh, normal political sphere and the way he ran his campaign, uh, which is what I like about him. Uh, not so much his policies and issues, although he you know, did try to, I think, accomplish some important social changes. Uh, but he ran an amazing campaign that was kind of outside the uh, super PAC type of campaigns, marketing campaigns we see today. Uh, in terms of you know, I don't really have many political heroes. <laughs> we have to they go back to probably to the days of Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And, uh, sure. When, sure. you know, when, when freedom was uh, a whole different concept than what we have in America today. 
Um, yeah, I, I know. My, like, uh, a long time ago, you know, there's probably a lot more homesteading, you, you, you know, and you could just travel out so you didn't have property taxes, et cetera. So, yeah. I'm starting to take, uh, you know, a lot more interest in Native American issues. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't have enough history yet to, to really to name the people. Uh, but what a different culture that was. Uh, you know, they, it goes back to that kind of that sustainable culture I'm talking about, right, where you have a zero-growth population, where you respect the environment, where uh, you, you have uh, – Stability, sustainability. Now, Paul, and let me ask you this. Are you we don't going have to be... that in the world today. I'm sorry to interrupt. There is just a few second lag here, but so I don't mean to interrupt. Um, are you going to be in the debates? Uh, are there any debates uh, scheduled, or has there been already in your district? Well, I mean, that's the way this campaign started out. The first forum, the, the earliest forum of the season is in, here in Minnesota is the Farm Fest, which is a, it's a huge uh, event, well attended. Half of my district is farm community. That's kind of one of the reasons this is kind of a tough district. It's kind of divided between urban and rural. Um, all the candidates agreed to attend. Uh, as soon as the uh, participant list was uh, announced, the major party candidates withdrew. So, I mean, it's an example of how the major parties don't want to acknowledge independent candidates. Um, but we will be, uh, but we are, you know, getting some respect from the media. They are including us. Uh, we will be appearing on a show called Almanac in, uh, on October 14th. So I will be meeting with uh, Angie Craig and Jason Lewis in that debate. We, Great. there was, uh, I know the League of Women Voters here in Minnesota was attempting to establish a candidate debate in at St. Olaf College here in our district. Uh, it sounds like that's not going to happen. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure of the details of why. Uh, we are still working very hard to try and organize a uh, candidate debate uh, sponsored religion. <laughs> Great. Well, if they oh. if they um, forfeit, then by technical default, you won the debate, I guess, because if they're disrespecting <laughs> yeah. a third party candidate, they're actually disrespecting the voters. Because I mean, our taxpayer dollars, you know, and your local district go towards conducting the election, and um, and if you're on the ballots. Um, you know, you should be exactly, in the mix yeah. of everything. And that's what we, you know, and that's fundamentally the primary message, uh, you know, all of these issues and implementation aside, that is our primary message, that if you're going to keep voting for people that aren't even willing to show up and talk to you, then maybe you need to reconsider what you're voting for. Um, yeah, I almost and, feel like we're trying to convince like someone in a bad relationship to like you know an abusive relationship to like leave or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, good analogy. I mean, that's what our I mean, two party system become. They're like an old married couple, right? And we need to see I mean, send some uh, someone out there to mediate. Yeah, and and if you were like a a, a writer or an actor and and you had an agent. And if they kept ripping you off, I mean, you know, you'd probably have no hesitation to fire them. And, you know, it seems <laughs> yeah, like... wouldn't you think? So it's it's a bold message. It's a tough road. Uh, but we're committed. I mean, that's our committed. That's our commitment. Uh, we were here in 2014. We'll be here today. We have a chance to win. Um, I mean, technically, in a three-way race, we'll only need 34% of the vote. Uh, yeah. you, you could win with 34% of the vote. And independent voters are 40% of the vote. And, of course, the, the major parties are going to whine about if If we do win, when we win, <laughs> the major parties are going to whine about the fact that we've elected a, a, a minor, uh, a, a non-majority candidate, right? Or she yeah, wasn't elected American. by a majority vote. But if they wanted a, a majority candidate, 
then they could give us ranked choice voting. We wouldn't have this issue. Yeah, and it, and if people, I mean, so I think congressional politics can be potentially a lot less divisive than presidential politics. I, I mean, if you know people want to step outside the status quo, present more competition into our political system. I mean, they can give you a chance for two years, and if they want to go back to, you know, R and D. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, then they'll have plenty of opportunities to do that. Um, well, in yeah. closing, is there any issues that I, I didn't men- we didn't mention today that you'd like to uh, touch on here before um, you know we end the conversation here today? Uh, well, I think that was <laughs> pretty comprehensive. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I appreciate your uh, your scope and your approach here, and uh, I, I think uh, you gave me a great opportunity to present. Um, things that people are not normally going to hear. Yeah, I think they, uh, we, you've, you've made a clear difference. And, um, you know, and, it, and I think on a lot of things, what you're saying, if you look at the polls, you know, I, I mean, you probably, you know, I side with, I side with Paula Overby or Paula Overby sides with us. And uh, that's what I'm just looking at here objectively. But, um, uh, as objective as I can, or at least keeping that in mind to do so. Well, good to talk to you today, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time. I mean, and you're taking the time to show up at the debates. You're taking the time to do an interview like this. And so we really appreciate it and um, for doing that and well, educating the public. Uh, yeah, You're most welcome. And above all, I think that's the responsibility of a representative. <laughs> if you're going to represent the people, you got to be willing to meet with the people. So, All right. Well, good luck. I, I your appreciate campaign. the time and thank you so much. Uh, and keep an eye on us. It's going to be we interesting. will. We will absolutely. Well, take care and uh, I hope you have a uh, spectacular Saturday. And uh, so, full speed ahead. Thanks very much. Have you're welcome. Bye bye.